Chapman University president, Daniele Strupa. Good morning and welcome to another State of the University address. Thank you so much for being with us this morning and uh, this is obviously a very special year. We're celebrating our 160th anniversary. As you know, Chapman was, was founded on March 1861, so in uh, just a few weeks, we're gonna enter our 163rd year of existence. Before we begin the, the, the State of the University per se, I have a couple of uh, groups that I want to thank. I wanna begin with uh, to thank our top employers, uh, people who have uh, companies who have uh, worked with us to hire our students, to provide internships, and create a partnership with the university, which are really long-standing partnership. We have you involved in a lot of activities with us. You have improved the kind of curriculum we offer. You offer opportunity to our students, and I hope you're finding uh, fruitful to take advantage of what our students have learned. You always think Chapman first, and that's something we really appreciate very much. I mentioned before, this is our 160th anniversary, and so we have collected what we call the faces of 160th year at Chapman. There have been literally hundreds of friends, faculty, staff, students who have been nominated. And I encourage you all to go and look at the, at the website and so you can see all the colleagues and friends who have been nominated for this honor. Thank you for representing so well what Chapman has become. I want to begin the, the presentation with what is probably the most important event that took place in the last 12 months. Now, if uh, I were to ask what that event is, I bet you most of you would say, well, uh, we were under COVID, so what, what happened? We just managed to go through these difficult times. But in fact, something really historical took place, and that's the sale of Brandman to University of Massachusetts. This is a very important uh, action that is gonna fruit us a significant amount of money, which we go directly into our endowment. And as you know, that's something that I've been very committed to from the very beginning of when I became the president, because the endowment is central to our ability to provide support to our students. And we talk a little bit about endowment down, down the line. It also really streamlines what we are doing and avoids confusion of brand. And I think that this really, there are lots of people who deserve plenty of credit for what has happened. First of all, I think the wisdom of, of our board of trustees that back in 2016, I'm sorry, 2007, um, decided that what was at the time University College should split off and become an independent university. That was a very courageous and uh, uh, gesture that really looked at the future of our institution. Um, and then over those years, Brandman grew, uh, consolidated his position, became well known as one of the best uh, remote learning uh, you know, and um, universities in the country. And so three years ago, uh, we reached out to the University of Massachusetts to see whether they had an interest in a partnership that would eventually lead to us selling them this institution. Everything is complicated when you talk about this kind of large scale deal. So it took us a while, but finally now, uh, Brandman University is being rebranded as University of Massachusetts Global and we wish our friends their tremendous success for the years to come. I think this is something that's gonna benefit the students. I know the faculty at Brandman are very excited about this change, and I'm really comfortable that we have done what is good for Brandman, for Chapman, and for University of Massachusetts. I wanna thank two more people, in, in three more people, I should say, in this context. Uh, the first one is uh, Park Kennedy, the chairman of the board who has been a very steady hand through the complex process that taken place, and, and Wiley Aiken who was the chairman of the board when this process began. They both have been very important advisors and supporters of the entire process. I wanna thank Jim Rozak. Uh, Jim Rozak is the trustee who is the chair of the finance committee, but he was also the chair on the special committee that we set up to deal with the sale of Brandman. Uh, again, very steady hand through the various difficulties, the up and downs, the complexity that were arising. So thank you, Jim, for what you've done. And finally, I want to thank uh, my EVP CEO, uh, Chief Operating Officer, Harold Hewitt, because he was our designated uh, negotiator in this process. And he spent uh, an innumerable number of hours uh, on this particular deal. So thank to all of them for what I think is a really very successful completion of very long, very complex project. And now, uh, let me look at the, like I, I did in the past, I'd like to look at our five-year plan and, and see how we have done on each of the uh, pillars of this plan. 
As you know, we are entering now the last year of the plan and the, the next academic year, and so it's a good time also for us to summarize where we are. So these are the five uh, items that we have focused our plan, and let me begin with the School of Engineering. As you, many of you have participated to the opening a few months ago of our beautiful Swanson Family Hall of Engineering. That's a phenomenal facility, beautiful building for wonderful students, great faculty and great research activity. Now the picture doesn't do complete justice to uh, the quality of the facility and I can't walk with you in the facility so I thought I would at least show you uh, a model of the facility. And this is our beautiful building, the new uh, Swenson Family Hall for a Fowler School of Engineering. Something that we are very proud and we are very grateful to the friends in the community who are helping make this uh, a reality. Now, the school exists for its students and our students have grown significantly. Uh, it's at a very healthy clip. And part of the reason for this growth of the student is the tremendous amount of partnership that the school has forged with companies. We have what we call the Student Accelerator Program. It's a program that immediately places our student in active contact with companies. Uh, you remember the very first slide I showed today was a show of all the companies we work with and how they interact with us. Well, engineering has taken obviously the lead to continue this and actually build on this concept so that we have students that are working on problems that come directly from some of these uh, technology companies so that while the student learn, the company can also take advantage of what we have to offer to them. It's a very, very important uh, thing for us. Uh, I also want to introduce uh, one of our newest members of the School of Engineering. You may remember him at uh, uh, a commencement. He was uh, walking around as actually was leading the procession of our students. So I'm not sure whether he's a very good student or maybe it's the faculty leader that takes the students or, or what is the situation here. But uh, clearly we are entering in a new world. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about that again in a few seconds. And our partnership with Boston Robotics is a very important, uh, another set of very important partnership that describes what's happening on our campus. The second pillar is the expansion of our research agenda. And I think you know how important research has been for me from the very beginning. When I came here and I joined Chapman University in 2006, I made it clear as a provost at the time that the future for Chapman had to be riding on significant growth of our research capability. And we'll talk in a second about why that's important and, and how that can be done. And, and so I'm, I'm really pleased to see how this is flourishing in ways that go beyond my, my wildest expectation. Uh, usually at, uh, at the State of the University, we share with you a poster. You know, we have a wonderful graphic design program. And uh, usually what happens is that uh, the, the teacher of a senior class assigns them uh, as a task to pre prepare a poster that embodies one of the themes that I offer the students. The students do a lot of work and eventually I get 20, 25 posters to look at. And then I meet with the students and I announce the, the winning poster. In this case, Alice uh, Premo is the author of this wonderful a poster that really has captured my, my imagination the moment I saw it when I was looking at all the different possibilities. Um, Alice always wanted to be an artist and she was sharing with us that uh, throughout her life she wanted to devote herself to art except apparently a short period when she was seven years old when she wanted to become a cat. But fortunately she uh, changed her mind and so now she's a young artist that uh, is graduating from our institution. And I like, there are many things in this poster that I really like and I just want to highlight them briefly. Uh, I like the, the reference to Leonardo with the figure in the center. Of course, it's a reference to Leonardo that is modified to include uh, a woman as part of the of the, the central figure. I like the reference, you know, maybe because I'm Italian, I like all these Italian references, but the one to um, Michelangelo, uh, you remember in the Sistine Chapel, you have uh, God uh, extending his hands to touch Adam's hand. And here you have the man extending himself and touching the robot hand. Uh, almost a reference to the way God created man, now man is creating uh, these robots. And so this is the reference to the uh, picture we saw before. I like the, the various signs that appear represented in this beautiful poster and, uh, uh, and a nod to the fact that knowledge is really a universal 
construct, and so we have on the left some uh, um, formulas from some Islamic manuscripts. So I thought that this was really a, a perfect uh, poster. Uh, as, you, as we did last year when we had to be remote, uh, we are going to um, distribute this at uh, homecoming. So we'll, uh, we'll give you your copy of this at, at the homecoming. Now, big important news, of course, we maintain our R2 status that we received only three years ago. Uh, this may seem a trivial thing, but it's not, because when you enter a new category, what happens is that usually you enter just uh, at the lower part of the category. And so you have to make sure that you maintain and improve on those metrics that allowed you to be part of the, of the category. And we have done so. So what are these metrics? There are essentially three important metrics that I want to discuss today. The first is uh, research expenditures. How much money is the university spending to support research. And you see here the dramatic growth over the last several years in our expenditure, starting from fiscal year 11, uh, about 3 million, just a little bit more than 3 million, to almost 24 million now. The, co the, the colors that we are really mostly interested, of course, are the blue, which are federal funding, and the yellow, which is nonprofit organization foundations. Those are very important, measure how the external world is looking at us. And you see how both curves, both, both, both colors have grown significantly. <clears throat> the green color is internal funds. So that represents the effort that we are doing and the priority that we are giving to research through our internal investment. So I'm very proud of these numbers and I think they show a really healthy growth of our, of our research function. Uh, we spoke about grants, so I could spend the entire rest of the state of the university just highlighting a lot of different grants. I will just pick up a few that I think are important. We have uh, here uh, Jennifer Totonci from our um, <coughs> pharmacy school. She has actually three R01 grants from NIH, kind of the golden standard in that field. Very exciting. She's bringing not, support, not just financial support, but also tremendous uh, growth of the kind of work that can be done in our school. Um, we, we spoke about support from federal funds. Now what about support from foundation? The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has funded our Thompson Policy Institute on disability with a three and a half million dollar grant. And actually the, the institute has raised almost 15 million dollars in support over, since, since its uh, inception. Um, that's a very exciting progress. Their work is very important. And like most of the work that we do at Chapman, is work that impacts the community around. So we are very, very proud of that. I'm also extremely proud of this grant. Different scale because the humanities don't get normally the same amount of support that the sciences uh, receive. But this is the largest grant we ever received actually from the NEH, the National Endowment for the Humanities. It's a very prestigious grant. And I'm so proud of uh, uh, Stephanie Tak Takaragawa, who is the recipient, and receive this grant to put in place a new program in Asian American studies. I, I wish uh, Stephanie were here. I would like to congratulate her personally. I know how hard it is, some of these grants, and it's really wonderful to see this happening. Um, the state of California also obviously has opportunities for grant, and uh, this year the, the California Governor's Office awarded four research teams, four research grants, and one of them is to Laura Glean, another superstar in the Green College of uh, uh, Health and Behavioral Sciences, two and a half million dollars. Uh, Laura is another one of those faculty who has been piling up tremendous amount of support since she arrived here, uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago. I remember when, when she joined us and uh, um, we have to thank uh, some of our colleagues like Roberta Lessor in the, in the Wilkinson College uh, for, uh, at the time she was the dean, for bringing to our attention uh, Laura and then eventually having her join us. Um, when I was a kid, I always had this, this dream of going to the space. You know, I was born in 55, so when we went to the moon, I was just a, a teenager. And I remember uh, being at, uh, uh, it was summer, and we were at the beach, and I got up early in the morning, obviously, in Italy, to witness the, the first steps on the moon. So, well, now I'm 66, it's clear that I'm not going to go into space. But I'm very proud to say that Chapman is going to space. And we have a fantastic program uh, led by uh, Justin Walsh in our Department of, uh, of Art. Uh, Justin had come up with this idea a few years ago. It's a very innovative idea of studying what he calls the archaeology in space. The idea is 
Well, we, we know what's going on there. We know the kind of experiment they do. But what we are witnessing is a, is a human activity. And human activities leave signs of their passage. And so the same way in which you may go to an old city and look at what is left there to figure out and to understand the, the social connection that were being built at the time of the city, we should probably do the same for a space station. And that's what uh, the central idea of the space archaeology is. It's a very innovative concept. Uh, NASA has embraced it, and so now we have an experiment actually flowing on the space station in which there is a little bit of Chapman. So I'm very grateful to, to Justin. I'm very grateful to all the people that have been working on this. This is really a, a, a gift that uh, I wasn't expecting the university would ever be able to, to achieve. So I talked about the, the metric of funding, important metric to evaluate the quality, the impact of our research. The second important metric is our, our graduate students, and doctoral students in particular. When we got in as an art institution, we were really at the bare minimum to be qualified as an art institution. But I'm really happy, and I'm sure you are too, to see this number growing. There are other doctoral programs that are being, uh, well, some that already started but don't have yet graduate, and some who are being proposed. And so those numbers will continue to increase. And I think it's not just a question of having more number, but we know how doctoral students are important for us as scholars, because this becomes our junior collaborators. These are people that, that from on one hand, certainly, we spend time and we teach them and we mentor them, we make them grow, but at the same time, they become really our partners. And it's a, such a privilege to have doctoral students that one can mentor, and I think that these numbers are going to continue to show our growth. Next slide is something that I've always been very proud to show to you every year. I think I've done this for, from the very first time that I gave a state at university. And it's a slide that talks about the impact of our work. The impact of our work is measured by how many people read what we do and mention us. Uh, you know, we work in our offices, in our labs, and we produce results and ideas that we think are important. But the question is, does anybody else think so? And these numbers, these are the citations. That's an imperfect measure, of course, but a very important one. And, and especially, particularly interesting to look at the progression from 2000 until now. In the year 2000, we were cited 180 times a year, which means every other day somebody would cite an article written or a book written by a professor at Chapman. Every other day. Now we have 12,077, which means about 30, 35 times a day somebody cites one of our works. This progression is a measure of the hard work that our faculty are doing, but also the quality of the work that they do. Because it's not enough to write papers, you want people to actually pay attention to them. Here too I could go on and give you plenty of examples, I just picked two of them. These are two of our professors who just recently published on journals. We have a tremendously high impact factor, 26, 17, 37. The impact factor is, uh, for those who are not uh, in this kind of world, is a measure of how impactful is the journal. And it's determined by looking at how many citations the journal receives per article that is written. So if a journal publishes 10 articles in a year and it's cited 20 times, then the impact factor is 2, the number of citations divided by the number of the articles. So to have article. Uh, Article published in places with a citation of 37, 26 is really an incredibly remarkable feat and contributes to the, to the result that we show in the previous slides. I also want to show this, uh, the slide that should make us all very proud. Uh, Stanford University published every year the list of the top 2% scientists in the world. So what they do is that they do a multi-factor analysis. So they look at uh, the, impact, uh, the, the citation index, so how many times somebody has been cited. They look at what is called the H index, which is a more refined way of looking at the impact of your work. And uh, what they call the I-10 index. So there are several measures. They look at the journals where people publish, and then they make some sort of a ranking. And we have now almost 20 of our faculty who are in the list of the top 2% in the world. So when I, at the beginning of this section, I spoke about what I thought that we should do when I came in 2006, I think that this is the kind of outcome that we have. When I came, I thought that we really needed to connect ourselves to powerful research and use that power of research to really jump into a different 
completely different new area. These faculty are carrying much of this burden. It's a particular pleasure to see that we even have uh, two of our deans are in this list. It shows you how even being an administrator does not have to necessarily reduce the, the work you do and the passion that you have for your discipline. It's my hope that as I show this uh, list year after year, it will become almost impossible for you to read the names because there are going to be so many that we're going to have to make them smaller and smaller, or maybe more and more pages. Now, every once in a while people ask me, Daniele, uh, research is good, but aren't we here for our students? And my answer has always been yes, we are here for the students, and research is very important to our students. It's important because we can involve them in this research and let them grow in ways that are not possible otherwise. It doesn't mean that every single class you take has to have a research component. But it's very important for our students to be involved, and I think here you're seeing some ex ex uh, expressions of such involvement, so that they understand the pleasure and the importance of discovering new things. And I think everybody knows this, that you learn a little bit by listening to what people tell you. You learn a little bit by reading books and papers. But the only way you really learn is when you try to do something. And the best thing for a student is to try to solve problems. And when they do that, that's when they really have a real learning experience. So I'm, I'm really proud, again, of our faculty and of our students, how they work together towards that end. I should add that many of the names you saw in the previous slides, and actually many of the names of all of us who are publishing uh, from Chapman, we publish with our students. And that's something that also makes us, I think, a very special place. Let me go now to the third pillar. The third pillar is what we call the changing student profile. So I'm going to show you some uh, very simple data. I'm not going to dwell here too much. Uh, the first important slide is a slide that you probably have seen already because I, I show it all the time. It um, demonstrates the challenge that every university is going to face in the next few years when the number of potential students will decrease dramatically. Um, this is a, a, an issue that I think is keeping most presidents uh, of universities across the country awake at night. Uh, and I think it's an issue that we are uh, preparing for. So I actually sleep at night because together with, uh, with my senior staff and together with the trustees, I think we are ahead of the curve and we are working already in this direction. And as you hear me often make reference to the growth of our endowment, that is probably our most important instrument to be able to deal with this particular challenge. Um, when you talk about higher education, uh, it happens to me wherever I go, I, with, with friends that are not uh, university related, uh, one of the questions I always have, but Daniel, but it, the model is unsustainable, the, the, the debt is so large, the students are saddled with these tremendous debts and they can't, they can't have a, a regular life. Well, it is true in, in the large, I think this is a national problem and a serious problem, I have to say that at Chapman, we, are, uh, we have done well. When you look at the numbers in the slide behind me, first of all, you see that our average debt is significantly lower than the average debt uh, across the nation. But that's not really the important number. I think the important number is the default rate. Our default rate is one of the lowest in the entire nation. It means that's a percentage of students who can't afford to pay back the loan and they default. So I think that what this shows is that the load that our students endure when they leave is sustainable to them, and it shows that our financial aid packages obviously have done what they're supposed to do. So this is an important component, I think, of our response to the crisis, to the slide that we just saw before of the decline of students that want to go to college. The next slide is also shows us a very hopeful situation because it shows the number of applications we are getting. Uh, they, it's growing at a very healthy pace. I think that for the year that we are looking forward to, the next year, if I understand correctly what Mike Pelly was telling me, our number is going to be between the 2020 and the 2021. So it's going to be the, si the second highest uh, collection of admission. Uh, now, you know, admission doesn't mean necessarily student will enroll. So this is significant work that has to be done to go from the 15,000 that we see there to the 1,700 that are actually going to be enrolling with us. And as the competition gets more heated among schools, as the, student, the number of students available diminishes and the skepticism about higher education grows, the so-called yield, which is the percentage of students that we admit and want to come, is under pressure. 
But again, I, I'm quite comfortable that with the work of all the people, both senior staff and, and the trustees, we're going to be able to address that issue as well. One of the things that pleased me very much also is to see the increased diversity of our student body. Um, I think if you, this is, I'm comparing here 2016 to 2021, so the last five years. And these are our undergraduate enrollment. And the big piece of the slide, this uh, big kind of red, uh, dark red, is uh, white students. And now for the first time, actually, I'm showing you numbers in which that is actually less than 50%. So our community is becoming increasingly diverse. It's becoming uh, uh, increasingly exciting to be here at Chapman. And the, the, the number that we see in terms of uh, retention and graduation uh, are showing us that the students who come here are successful, because that's the most important thing. You don't want to admit students and then see them leave after one year. Our retention rate now from freshman to sophomore is in excess of 91%. That's a spectacular number. So I'm, I'm really heartened by this number because they tell us that we can diversify our student body and not compromise on the quality. That's the most important thing, and not compromise on the service that we give them and that will make them successful. At the graduate level, we've been there for a long time. Uh, that's more traditional, so it's less of a challenge, but I think it's also interesting also here. And I think that uh, uh, these two slides tell us that Chapman is on its way to become a Hispanic-serving institution, which I think would be a very important thing for us to do, uh, because of, I think there is a lot of talent that we can really draw from that pool and that is not yet interested or is not looking at Chapman as an institution of choice. And that's what I think we should be able to become. Let me move to the next uh, um, pillar, and that's the uh, optimizing our campus footprint. I'm going to talk about three major initiatives. The first one is the beautiful Sandy Simon Dance Center. Uh, we have one of the best dance programs in the country, and we believe that they deserve a world-class quality facility. And so I'm, I don't have a model here because the model that we actually have of the new dance center is too big to be transported. So I'm going to take you there for a few minutes just to show you what the building looks like right now. Well, hello, everybody. And thank you very much for joining me in this walk through this uh, magnificent building. Now, when you look at it right now, it looks a little bit run down. But uh, in a few months, our, our people here are putting together one of the most remarkable constructions here at Chapman University. This is the inside of the packing plant, about 100 years old, and is now being completely refurbished to house the magnificent Sandy Simon Dance Center. We are one of the best dance programs in the nation, and we believe that they deserve the very best facilities. So this entire space that you see is going to be gutted out and essentially a building is going to be built inside this building and that's going to be the house of the center. It's going to be 30 feet down to my left here. Uh, we're going to break through the, the floor and the building is going to come through with the mezzanine. It's going to be a really remarkable construction. The location is fabulous. The, the, the building is historic, beautiful lights coming from the sky. On my right hand side there, we have the K, you know, our, one, our most recent uh, residence hall. And I'm really excited. When I look around today, I walked in and I said, well, I can't believe that that's where we are now. And thinking that by this summer, this place will be ready for our faculty, for our students and for our community to enjoy. So I'm very excited. I'm glad you had a chance to take a look at this uh, sneak peek in, the, in this new facility. Thank you very much. Now, that's how the building looks now. Uh, and of course, there's going to be a lot of work to be done by, by the end of this academic year. The building is going to be ready. And so our new class of students next fall will enter in an absolutely stunning facility. I want to thank uh, Sandy and Ron Simon for this investment. It's an investment in the beauty of the campus. Most important is an investment on the success of our students. And that is really what is the most important thing. And ultimately, that's why you are watching the State of the University today. The second big project of which I'm also extremely proud is the expansion of the Hilbert Museum of California Art. This has been a labor of love of uh, our dear friend, the Hilberts. Uh, they have made generous donation to help us with the construction, to, 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 to fill the building with a fantastic collection. And 
again, more than anything else, they've given us a tremendous passion. Mark can be found anytime you want to go visit the museum, just eager to, to show the museum to the visitors. And now the Hilbert Museum has become one of the most visited attractions in Southern California. It's become really a point of attraction because it, it, it really is a very beautiful focus museum. But the same that was happening to dance was happening to the Hilbert Museum. There wasn't just enough space to display all the beautiful art that we did. So fortunately, just adjacent to the Hilbert Museum, there was the dance studio of our students. And uh, so when we decided that, the, that we could build a larger dance studio for them, that space became available. And now it's going to become the new uh, Hilbert Museum. So the sequence of steps is that by the end of this summer, we're going to have the dance studio ready for our students. They're going to move in in the fall. And then at the same time, we're going to build the we're going to you begin the construction of the new wing and the complete redesign is not just a new wing but the complete redesign of the Hilbert Museum um, so that we can really offer the city not just a new museum but a, a new gateway if you want into into the city just imagine you're coming off the the train at the train station as you exit the train station the first thing that you will see are these images so you're going to see this museum with with this uh, pathway so to speak that leads you into the city so it's going to declare de facto orange as a city of art and that to me is very important because it's part of our partnership with the city we are not just living here but we are a, a component that really uh, enhances the quality of life for all of our friends, residents here in the city. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about what is going to happen. It's going to take us another year. So next year, at the, at the end of next summer, we're going to be ready with this beautiful new museum. The, the third project brings us to the other campus, the Rinker campus in Irvine. If there is something that has often troubled me with the campus, and I know that my colleagues and friends share that concern, is the fact that the campus seems, uh, doesn't seem really like a campus. It's a collection of buildings that were housing companies, and of course we have revamped them inside so that we have beautiful classrooms, great laboratories, they're perfect learning spaces, but they don't really feel like a campus. And so Colette Crepel, our new vice president for campus planning, well, I say new, but she's been with us now for a while, um, is planning a complete redesign of the entire campus so that you, you, when you walk in, you will feel that you are at Chapman University. And part of that, the very first building that we're going to completely redo is going to be the new uh, student center. You, you see there is a common theme here. Whatever we do is because we think about what's going to improve the experience for our students. This new student center, you see here some uh, images, is going to be designed that once you move from our buildings here to there, you realize that you are in the same university. It's a comprehensive center. Right now, the students don't have that. The students go to class, go to the office of their professor, go to their labs, and then there is a space where they can have lunch and a space where they can sit, but they don't have a center dedicated completely to them with the lounge and everything else. So I'm, I'm very excited that we're going to have this new facility that will transform the face of the Rinker campus. And that's only step one because then we have a research building on which we are working and, and the entire beautification of the campus. So as I give my successive state of the university, you will be brought abreast of also these other developments that we are having there. And now let me get to the last of the five pillars, uh, and that's the comprehensive fundraising campaign. I just want to give you a brief update. Um, first of all, I think we are doing that the campaign has not been launched yet. Uh, we are in what we call the, the silent phase, if you want, so we are still developing uh, all the materials, but we already raised $220 million. The number of donors and supporters is growing, and our uh, giving day has set a record once again for number of contributors as well as for money raised. So those are all good indicators. What we are really trying to do very carefully is to uh, connect what we raise money for to what we need. We are trying to really drive 
the friendship and the support of our friends towards what we are doing. And the example that I saw, that I showed you before, are, are perfect of that. A new dance center for our, for our students, a new hall of engineering for our students. This slide here that I'm showing you is just a simple capture of some of the very latest uh, gifts that we have received. And this slide itself is, is worth almost $15 million. And so we have, uh, obviously, the, the Swanson Family uh, Hall of Engineering. We have an endowment for experiential learning and merit scholarship in the Arduino School of Business and Economics, uh, need-based scholarships from a fund, a Burra, the Burra Executive Professor of Accounting, thank you, Jim and Kathy Burra, uh, Jim, our trustee for, for this gift, an anonymous donor who have given a very large bequest uh, to endow teaching fellowships. And finally, just uh, maybe a week or so ago, a, a wonderful gift from Ambassador Ron Spogli. Uh, well, yes, Spogli, they, they say, but it's an Italian name, so I'll pronounce it the way we would pronounce it in Italy. So Ron Spogli to establish a chair in free enterprise. And this is just a, a, a very small capture, really, of what's happened in the last couple of months. And we really continue to work very hard to make sure that we align the interests of our donors with the needs of the university. A couple of slides about finances. I know that this is the most boring part, so I'm going to be very quick, but I just want to tell you where we are because these have been a couple of really interesting years. And uh, there were obviously concerns among faculty, among staff, among senior staff, trustees. How would the university weather the challenges? It turns out we weathered them very well, partly because of the successful investment uh, the market has been doing very well, and partly because of how we manage the resources. So, um, our net assets grew, actually grew at the fastest pace ever, more than $200 million. This number is important because it's, our, it's an indication of our uh, stability. It is the same value that for an individual would be what we call the net worth. And so in addition to what the salary is that one receives and then pays for expensive, the net worth is what tells you what's going to happen if there is a catastrophic event. Not if you need more money for a car, then you don't go and take money out of your net, your, your net worth. But suppose something catastrophic happens, a tremendous illness uh, or, or, or something of that nature. That's where we know as individuals we have stability. And for a university, this is that number. So uh, it's a number that's very important. And obviously, part of my job is to ensure the growth and the success of that number. The second thing we mentioned before, the endowment. Uh, the endowment also has done tremendously well with a growth of 150 million last year. In fact, now, at least at the end of December, we were above 600 million. Now, January has been, as you know, a very volatile month in the market, so we are probably a little bit below that. But I, I, I'm pretty comfortable that we'll be quickly moving towards higher numbers. I mean, I, when I became president, I set two uh, goals, an intermediate goal of 500 million that I wanted to reach by the end of 2023, and then a billion dollar. And we are obviously way ahead because we are only in 2022 and we already passed that, the, five, the, the half a billion dollar mark. People always say, why are we putting all that money there? Shouldn't that money better used by spending it? Uh, again, this, this is an account that actually has very great importance for how we manage the institution. And the majority of the money is for our scholarships. So when we look at what is that bunch of money doing, why is that invested, why is that in the banks instead of, of, of being spent? Well, because 63% of that money is used to provide scholarship and loans to our students. And then you see the rest is mostly chairs and money that goes to schools and colleges. So this is not money that we are stashing away. This is money that actually works for the university, but the beauty of it is that it works for the university and will continue to work for the university in years to come. We had a few changes uh, and very exciting ones in the last several months. I have a great pleasure uh, mentioning our new provost, uh, Norma Bouchard. Uh, Norma joined us about six months ago, and I have to tell you, I greatly enjoy working with her. I think she's a phenomenal leader. She's a, a very fun person to work with, which to me is important. And uh, really with significant experience and has already taken a real hard look at how we do things. And I have to say, I, I'm really thrilled that she's decided to join us. I know that she will keep growing in her, in her job and her presence here is going to be extremely important. The second person that I want to mention is not exactly new, but when I was talking about the fundraising campaign, 
Uh, obviously, probably everybody thought, uh, what about uh, Cheryl Bourgeois? Well, that was one of the great announcements of last year. Cheryl left us, and so we now have a new chief advancement officer in Matt Parlo. Matt is, has been a very successful dean for the Fowler School of Law, incredibly successful. And its success, again, is measured in, in a variety of metrics, in the quality of the faculty, in the quality of the students, in the employability of the students, in the fundraising that the school has had. So all of this together makes him a really fantastic partner for me, and I'm really happy and thrilled that he has agreed to join me in this new role. Uh, he and I have been working already two months, and I can tell you, you've seen from the previous slides, that in those two months, uh, he's already hit the ground running, and I'm extremely excited, and I know that he's gonna do just a terrific job, and is a very, very positive presence for all of senior staff. So I'm grateful to, to Matt for accepting this, this new challenge. Uh, because as a dean, of course, this is not what you would consider a standard next step. So I think uh, Matt is committed to the university and his commitment really shines through this new uh, appointment. I also want to thank Janine Hill for accepting my request to step in as acting vice president uh, for research. And uh, Janine is, uh, is a person I, I can never say enough good things about her. Uh, she is one of the architects, if not the architect for our health science programs. Uh, something that she brought to me back in 2006, 2007. She has been a selfless uh, member of our institution. She was acting dean for the Schmidt College. Then she became the dean for Schmidt College. Then she became the dean for Crean. And now she's still the dean of Crean, but she has added this title to help us go through the next several months. She is not only a tremendous dean, but she's also a force and a presence in the region. And so I'm really happy because this, uh, her, her, her relevance to the community in Irvine is witnessed by the fact that the mayor of Irvine has asked her to join on the Innovation Council. Something that, again, enhances the visibility of the university and gives us uh, great, great visibility. Uh, another wonderful hire, uh, of which I'm extremely proud, is uh, Reg uh, Stewart. Uh, Reg is our first uh, vice president for DEI. And again, a person whose impact has been felt immediately from his arrival. I, I, if I have to highlight some of his qualities, his experience, he knows what he's dealing with. His charisma, uh, students, faculty, and colleagues are immediately attracted to him. His demeanor and his solidity and yet ability to bring everybody together. I work with him now for four or five months and I couldn't be more thrilled. So I, I have to say that when I look at uh, uh, Reg and, and Matt and Norma, I'm really lucky because they are bringing a tremendous addition to senior staff, which is really the group of people who runs the university. These are, are, are gonna be the new digs. Uh, after being in a limbo for a few months, now Reg is gonna occupy a renovated office on the third floor of um, Argyros Forum. And uh, uh, that's gonna be kind of the central command for his operation. I'm really glad and I look forward the next few days when we're going to open to go and officially open his new, his new facility. Um, he's already done several things. I, I just want to highlight a couple. Uh, Justin Riley that used to work under uh, the Dean of Students has now moved uh, uh, to work directly for Reg as a Director of Black Excellence and Achievement. We are in the last days of our search for a similar position for Latinx achievements. I think that that's a very important, especially as we move towards the goal of becoming an Hispanic serving institution. The cross-cultural center also is going to be under the umbrella of, of REG. And so we are not going to have a centralized and unified approach to deal with all these variety of issues. And I'm, I'm really excited about this. But um, one thing that I want to say is that our commitment to these values is not just in the administrative appointments we make or in the center that we create or in the special hires we do, but it's also witnessed by what our faculty do. And I could give you, again, a very long list, but I will, do, I will just mention one colleague, uh, Pete Simi. Pete is uh, somebody I have a tremendous regard for. I consider him a, a dear friend as well. Pete is a professor in our sociology department, and he spent more than 20 years working with uh, hate groups. He sometimes went undercover and embedded himself in white supremacist groups to understand 
their motivation, to understand what, what turns a person into somebody capable of such hatred and what can be done to modify that. Because of his experience, he has been testifying in front of Congress many times. He has recently been an expert witness on the Charlottesville trials, very, very important case. And he's actually the executive director of a, so Life After Hate, um, a, which is an organization devoted to what I was mentioning before, understanding what makes people hateful and helping them move to a different life after that. How can we recuperate people? I have great um, admiration for, for Pete because he's not just writing about this, he actually leaves all of this and his contributions are extremely important. I want to close with a few more slides about the successes of Chapman. I mean, it's uh, one of the pleasant parts for me during the State of the University to tell you how well we've been doing. I'm not going to bore you, so I'm going to try to move swiftly through this. Rankings, um, we all criticize the rankings, but they, they matter. Uh, so the US News and World Report rankings, we are now at the highest we've ever been, and 122 in the national institutions. I know that there is plenty of room there for, for growth. Uh, the timing of the growth is, is not easy to quantify, but I know that we will eventually see numbers of a very different nature. Um, even in the, the World University rankings, that we are now 158, uh, we are ranked as uh, uh, one of the best institutions for undergraduate learning. So it looks like not only we are comfortable with what we are doing, but the community around us is expressing very positive views about our, our work. Um, we have important ranking for the Dodge College. Stephen Galloway is probably very proud of this. Uh, this is the highest ranking we have ever had in our history. We are now number four in the nation. Uh, which for a film school almost means you are like number four in the world, probably. Uh, it, it is not surprise because we have fantastic faculty, we have fantastic students. We'll see a couple of them later. But also I think that the, the institution really is, is stewarding that tremendous resource. Um, our Arjun School of Business Economics is now ranked 77. We have made no mystery of the fact that we want to take that school in the top 50. Uh, those are not easy movements. Um, I remember when President Dodi interviewed me. Uh, this is December to November 2005. And he told me, he said, you know, Daniele, one of my dreams is to see the business school in the top 50. Well, I think that now we are close to making that happen. Uh, and so it's very exciting. It's a, it's a challenging goal because you compete with the very best business school in the, in the nation. But I think the quality of our faculty and uh, the support of our friends is going to be really central in making this achievement possible. I said before about the wonderful things that Matt has done with the law school. Uh, the most important thing to me, there are lots of important things in this slide, but to me the, the placement of our uh, students in jobs is incredibly important. Uh, the most diverse class that we ever had, the strongest incoming class. I think that that's really exciting. Look at this increase of the LSAT from 155 to 160. It's incredibly hard to go up even on one or two points in those rankings. And so this really is a proof that the quality of our students is just jumping up. And I'm, I'm really proud of what the school has done. And I'm looking forward to the school also growing in, in their rankings. Uh, what makes a university great ultimately are two things, are great students and great faculty. And so we are always on the prowl to hire the very best faculty. I could give you a list of everybody who joined us this year. You'll see that complete list when we meet in the summer for the faculty reunion. But I want to just highlight one of our new colleagues, uh, Dwight Roden, who's going to join us in the fall. Uh, he's a very uh, accomplished dancer and choreographer. Uh, his company is called Complexions from New York, has been incredibly successful. I, I'm, hope there's going to be enough for you to see here and uh, you should Google them and, and see what kind of stuff they do. I said before, you, you can see the theme here. We have a great dance department, thanks to the great faculty we have there. We have now are going to have a great world-class facility and now we are bringing in additional world-class faculty. So that's how we put all of this together. The great students, the great physical space and the great faculty. And then success happens almost automatically, I would say. Our students, our students continue to impress us. This is a fabulous uh, slide because it shows how our graduate from uh, physician assistant uh, have received some of the most important awards in the nation. 
it's a very important thing. As you know, the physician program will be supported by the Simon Foundation. So another example of what we said about dance, I could now make the same comment for physician assistant. We built a program that we thought was important for the community. We got people like Janine Hill to coordinate the creation of that program and put together a very strong program. And then we got Ron Simon and his foundation willing to put this financial support so the students could graduate without debt from a program that will place them into really good professions. And now the students are paying us back. They're paying us back by winning awards and making our name uh, visible throughout the country. So again, the collaboration of the different components. Trefina uh, Yeboa, she's a writer, creative writing, and she's been also receiving a very prestigious award. And she's now a PhD student. And we are really proud of her, and uh, uh, I'm proud of their, of their advisors and the faculty who work with her, uh, Richard Baus, Jim Blaylock, Anna Lehi. Uh, you see the pattern here. You bring in some of the best faculty that exist uh, in the country, and you put them together with really good students. We provide the support, you know, the, the creative writing program is the program that we support with scholarship to allow them to attract the very best students. And then, as I said, the students pay you back uh, by, by achieving, by, success, by being successful. So this is a really wonderful, wonderful example. Uh, and talking about successful students, one of the exciting things is the, the Academy Award and the Student Academy Award winner this year, 2021, is Fumi Morari, one of our students for a short film when the sun sets. And uh, um, we should be showing you a few short clips from this movie to give you a sense of what she's been able to do. Very successful, very exciting. Uh, Fumi has an interesting background. She was in investment banking before moving into becoming a, a, a movie director. So uh, interesting life, uh, life story and something that again, you put together great faculty, you get a great facility, the support, and then the results are these uh, fantastic things. Um, the Orange County Register every year publish a list of the most influential people in the county. And this year we are really happy to have three of them. Uh, one of them gets a slide by herself, but so I'll start with Fred Smoller and Justin Riley. Justin, our alum, but also uh, the director of Black uh, uh, Excellence and Achievement, and Fred Smoller, professor in political science. And uh, this is our third uh, top influential person uh, in the county, and she's actually an alumna, and she just got nominated this year as one of the five top te uh, teachers of the year. Uh, for, for uh, California. That's a tremendous achievement. Those who know me know how passionate I am about the role of teachers, maybe because I had four kids and I've seen each one of them go through the schools and I see the struggles and I see how a teacher can make a difference. And those who made a difference in the life of my kids are, are very dear to me. And I see also when people choose not to make a difference. And so for us to have a, a teacher of the year is really a reason for, for joy and for pride, pride of what our school has been able to achieve. More success, uh, the Irvine Chamber of Commerce uh, has published the 40 under 40 and two of them are our, our people. Uh, Alisa Driscoll, Vice President of Community Relations, a uh, wonderful colleague. I work with her on a regular basis. The relation with the city obviously are very important to Chapman University because this is our home. And Marta Castrejon, a talent acquisition specialist in the human resources department. So congratulations to both Marta and Alisa. Uh, we spoke about 40 under 40. Well, uh, Forbes actually recognized also 30 under 30 and five of these names for the category of up and coming innovators are actually our alumni. Uh, and so uh, you, you see them here. And that's a very remarkable expression of how successful Chapman is not just in attracting good students, not just in graduating them, but to see them through success throughout their life. Um, the last uh, um, highlight I want to point out is uh, 
Jim Byron um, is an alum, class of 15, and is just named, been named president of the Nixon Foundation. And there is an interesting uh, twist there because he replaces uh, Hugh Hewitt uh, on the right here, who actually is a professor at Chapman University. So our connection with the Nixon Foundation remains strong, and uh, I, we have a very good partnership. Um, as you know, we have the, received re help from some of the common friends that we have to build uh, an emphasis in, in our uh, university on presidential studies. And we now have uh, several endowed positions there, and so that's a partnership that is going to last uh, uh, for the future. Um, where are we now? Well, we are, as I said before, we are at the last year of our uh, five-year strategic plan. So this means that this summer, uh, together with senior staff, I will put together the plan for the next five years. And the board will approve that plan in December. In June, we have a strategic retreat with the board in which many ideas are going to be assembled, discussed, agreed upon, rejected. But in the, in the meantime, uh, I'm looking forward to both faculty town halls that are going to be run through the office of the provost, as well as uh, town halls that uh, uh, Dean Price is going to organize with students. We need everybody to provide us their ideas of what would be uh, goals and trajectories that we think are important uh, for, uh, for the next five years. I can, uh, I, while I don't have the plan yet, of course, I can tell you that certainly a significant portion of the plan is going to be the development of our health science campus. Uh, we have still some availability of space there. We have a very large building, 9701 Geronimo, that needs to be filled. So part of the plan is going to decide what are we going to do with that space. Um, and another import, important uh, discussion is going to be what programs we're going to have to build there. But that's just going to be a portion of what we're going to do. So the, the, my request to you as you listen to this State of the University is to feel free to send us or to participate to these town halls or to send us ideas for things that we should keep in mind. Uh, at the same time, you realize that with our strategic plan are always fairly focused. You've seen the one that I just described today with the five pillars. So we don't do everything because you can't do everything. But we can certainly uh, find a way to fine tune and, and do something that is meaningful. Now, as I close, I, I, I want to just share some final thoughts. Um, these have been two really difficult years. Uh, it really, we started all of this in March, at least officially, in March 2020. But I remember having discussions with Harold Hewitt in January. 2020, when we felt that this pandemic was a potential threat. And we started thinking in terms of uh, fiscal maneuvers that we could do to protect the university and the students in this situation. These have been difficult years for all of us. They've been difficult years for our students. They had to transition to a different way of learning. Uh, a way of learning that, in a way, doesn't put on them the same pressure that, that they have when they're in class, but this also has some negative consequences. It's, it's a new university in which they don't have the kind of social life that they were looking for. And if you remember when you were 18, you know that social life is probably the most important thing. So those have been complicated years. Um, these have been complicated years for, for the parents. Uh, I, I know this because I receive messages from the parents every day. And some parents complain that uh, we are being too strict with our COVID uh, precautions. Other complain that we are not strict enough with our COVID precautions. And this, this, this points to the, the stress that they are feeling because they are rightfully concerned about their children and probably have additional stress from their own life. Mm -hmm. This has been a difficult year for, for the faculty. We asked you in March 2020, to move to something that, frankly, we hadn't prepared you for. Nobody was really prepared for. And yet, you jumped in and you did it. But I understand that this has been complicated and at, at times uh, unpleasant. You know, the last week was my first week, and I taught um, remotely the first two classes, because that's uh, how we, do we did the first week. And I don't like it. I, I want to be in my class with the student in front of me. I want to see what they think about the, the, the comments I'm making. I want to be able to interact with them. So I, I understand the challenge, the difficulty faculty felt. The group that probably felt the greatest stress is staff. We, we rarely talk about the staff, but I know how difficult these two years have been for you. 
when the first year started with the pandemic, we decided not to rehire vacant positions. And this has meant for many of you additional work under stressful conditions. So the stress of the pandemic, the fear for uh, uh, health consequences, coupled with an office with less people to do the same amount of work, sometimes more work. And I, I realize that that's putting tremendous pressure. I've seen the pressure on the deans. I've seen it on my senior staff. Uh, Harold Hewitt, under tremendous pressure as he was managing or pro providing leadership to the COVID response while we were embedded in the Brandman deal, and of course the regular work that we do every day, and managing fundraising in a, in a time in which you can't meet with your donors, or managing admission when you can't have the student do tours. So this has been a difficult year for everybody. It's been a difficult year for, for me as well. Uh, there have been many evenings that I said, I'm not really sure why I'm doing this job. Uh, and uh, the, the, the pressure has been almost relentless. And yet when I think about all of this, I also look at what I just showed you. And I see something remarkable. The institution is strong. It's not strong only because our finances are strong, which is something that I take particular pride in and I know Harold does. So that's one direction. But it's strong because our students are successful. You've seen just, just a, a little bit of the success of our students. We are strong because our faculty continue to be successful. And again, I just showed you a few slides, five, six, ten slides, but our faculty are there and they're publishing, they're writing, and they're impacting their community. So it is remarkable to me that despite all of this and despite the sense of anguish and, and of pressure that we feel every day, we are still able to perform incredibly well. And so my, my last message is, when we feel this pressure, let's not think about what that's doing to us, but let's focus on what we are able to do for others. When a professor takes five minutes of his or her time to meet with a student who is struggling, that professor is changing a life. Because the student not only is helped into learning whatever topic was at hand, but he feels that he's not alone. He feels that the teachers are with him, for him. When Jerry Price, one of the people who had been under the strongest amount of pressure throughout this entire period, when Jerry Price meets with a student that misbehaved, maybe with the parents, and finds a way to correct the behavior and, ins and, and, and instill compassion while upholding the truth, he is changing dynamics that are very important for the students. I'm thinking about Mike Pelly and all the financial aid office when they squeeze that extra few dollars, maybe because I called them and I said, Mike, there is, a, there is a student who is struggling, and they're able to go and review again the numbers and, and provide that extra help that eases the burden on a family. They are changing things. When our public safety intervenes and helps our students in distress, our faculty in distress, I think all of this is what we need to remember. When our health center provide the support they provided over the last two years, there is one hero that I want to single out throughout the entire university, and that's Jacqueline Dietz. Jacqueline has been an incredible, an incredible uh, source of strength for all of us, and she was managing a completely unforeseen situation. So whenever the students go there and get the help that they need, that's changing a life. So what I'm asking you is, as you go through the difficult times, Try to avoid thinking about what's that impacting you and think what you are doing in every single day to help other people live a better and a more successful life. I think that that really is the meaning of the anything imaginable that we always talk together. Thank you, everybody.